Hello again and welcome to subtopic 1.4 which is on chromatography. Chromatography is a technique widely used to physically separate and identify components in a mixture. In addition to this we can actually determine the relative proportions of each of these components present. It allows for the separation, isolation, purification and identification of components of various mixtures, complex or even simple. The word chromatography is derived from two Greek words, chroma referring to colour, graphene means to write, so you can think of this as a form of colour writing. This technique was first employed by a scientist by the name of Mikhail Svet in the 1900s, and he looked at separating plant pigments, and um, this was occurring from plant leaves. Chromatography is going to link into the, this first science understanding, so chromatography techniques including thin layer chromatography, TLC, gas chromatography, high performance liquid chromatography and ion chromatography. They involve the use of what we call a stationary phase and a mobile phase to separate the components of a mixture. Chromatography and in particular what we call adsorption chromatography is based on a principle which we call adsorption which sounds very similar to absorption but they mean two different things. Adsorption is the attachment of particles to the surface of some material, which we often call the stationary phase. The reason why this occurs is due to the formation of various primary and secondary interactions or a combination of both that allows this attachment. And please again, just make sure you're not confusing this with absorption. In this slide you can see what the difference is. So on the left we have pictures to represent absorption or this incorporation of particles into another material whereas adsorption on the right hand side is more about this attachment or this sticking onto the surface of another material. Adsorption chromatography can in all cases consist of what we call a stationary phase and a mobile phase. The stationary phase is a solid material onto which components of a mixture are initially adsorbed. And we know the word stationary means to not move. So these components, these stationary phases, do not move in a chromatography setup. The mobile phase often is a liquid or a gas that carries the components of a mixture over the stationary phase as it flows through it. We say that components can dissolve in the mobile phase or we can say they are desorbed in the mobile phase. This shows you what uh, we mean by adsorption and desorption. So adsorption is these, or uh, are these components uh, sticking onto or attaching onto the surface of uh, some type of material. Desorption is the exact opposite, where it goes from um, the surface to then going into solution. We know components in a mixture can adsorb to the stationary phase and desorb or dissolve in a mobile phase to varying degrees. The components can separate according to how strong they form interactions with the stationary phase but also the mobile phase. The factors that can influence these interactions are size and the polarity as well as the charge. For the next science understandings, we've got the rate of movement of the components. It's caused by the differences between the strengths of the interactions between atoms, molecules or ions in the mobile and stationary phases. You need to be able to predict the relative rates of movement of components along the stationary phase on the basis of their polarities and charge given the structural formulae or relative polarities of the two phases. The second understanding Data from chromatography techniques can be used to determine the composition and the purity of substances. You need to calculate and apply what we call RF values and retention times in the identification of components in a mixture. There are various chromatography uh, techniques that can exist. So ones that we're going to talk about are highlighted in bold. Thin layer chromatography, gas chromatography, high performance or high pressure liquid chromatography, ion chromatography, one that I'll also mention is column chromatography, but it's not 100% relevant to the course. We're going to start off with thin layer chromatography, or TLC as I'll call it. This allows for the separation of components over a thin surface of a stationary phase. This is made up of a thin layer of adsorbent material. This is typically silica or alumina that is bonded to the surface of some inert sheet, which can be glass, 
quite commonly aluminium or a polymer. How do we actually perform TLC? So we're going to relate to this diagram over to the right. We've got a pencil line that's drawn approximately one centimetre from the bottom of our TLC plate. And this is what we call our origin. The mixture to be separated is then prepared in solution, if it's not already. Then we take the mixture, we spot it using a fine pipette along this origin, this pencil line. We then place our TLC plate into a jar containing our solvent or our mobile phase. We place on a lid. This allows for the atmosphere to become saturated with the solvent and it prevents the mobile phase from evaporating from the TLC plate. Note that this solvent must sit below the origin and it also is chosen to have a different polarity to the stationary phase. The TLC plate is carefully then placed into the beaker and the uh, lid is placed back on top. Once this is done, then what happens is that the mobile phase itself then flows up the stationary phase or the TLC plate by what we call capillary action. This is an upward force due to adhesion. Components of the mixture are then going to separate um, to varying degrees. Their rate of movement will be based on the strength of interactions that they have with both the stationary phase, the TLC plate, and the mobile phase or the solvent. On the diagram to the right, you can see that the solvent or the mobile phase has traveled approximately halfway up the TLC plate. And the highest point at which the solvent travels is what we call the solvent front. Once the mobile phase has almost traveled to the top, we then remove the plate. We mark in where the solvent front is with a pencil and we allow it to dry. So the solvent eventually will evaporate and if we didn't mark in our solvent front, we wouldn't know how far it actually reached. The relative distance of each component that has been separated can then be determined by a calculation of what we call the RF value. So in our diagram to the right, we can see that we've had a mixture of various dyes. It's been separated into three different components and we can measure the relative distance that each of these have moved compared to the distance traveled by our solvent front. The RF value is the distance the component travels as a fraction of the distance traveled by the solvent front from the origin. We can define this as a formula. So the RF value is equal to distance traveled by the component divided by the distance traveled by the solvent front. In the scenario on the right, let's say for example, the solvent front um, has traveled 5.0 centimeters. We can then take one of the components, like the red component, measure how far it's traveled from the origin, and in this case, it has traveled 1.7 centimeters. We can calculate its RF value by taking the distance the component has traveled, divided by the distance the solvent front has traveled, that which is equal to 1.7 over 5.0, and we get an RF value of 0.34. Sometimes TLC plates may contain a fluorescing agent. Um, that's because components could be colorless, so we wouldn't be able to work out how far they've actually traveled. The treatment with UV light may then show these components appearing as dark patches. In conclusion, the distance the substance moves along a particular stationary phase using a particular mobile phase is going to be characteristic of that particular substance. We then often look at taking those results and tabulating them so a comparison can be made and you can actually use that to identify which components are actually present. This is applicable to all chromatography techniques and not just TLC. I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the rate of movement of a component along a stationary phase does depend on a couple of things. It depends on the size and polarity of the components in the mixture. It also depends on the relative polarities of the stationary and mobile phase. And this rate of movement and this attraction that can form follows the like dissolves like principle. Now that doesn't really explain anything, so it's better if we rationalize this by discussing the types of secondary interactions that can be formed. Relative polarity is determined by a few things. It's determined by the number of polar or charge groups in a molecule or ion. And essentially, if there are more polar groups or there's more charge, we can suggest that it's going to be more polar. The second thing is the size of the molecule or ion. If it's larger, it generally becomes less polar. 
Here's an example question. So we've got a TLC plate that is separating a mixture of amino acids. We can see those amino acids onto the, the right here. The first part here, part A, we need to calculate the RF value of methionine. So methionine has traveled from this point here up to this point here. We need to work out how far it's traveled up from the origin and then look at dividing it by the distance that the solvent front has actually reached. There's our formula again. Let's plug in our numbers. So we've got the RF equal to about 14 and a half divided by 26, which is the, the height of the solvent front. And we get an RF value of 0.56 to two significant figures. Generally, we will be looking at writing RF values to two significant figures unless stated otherwise. In part B, we need to predict whether glycine will have a lower or higher RF value than methionine. Really, the bottom line is, if a component travels further up the TLC plate, then it will have a higher RF value. So we can see that really glycine is going to have a, the higher RF value. To explain that, glycine travelled up the stationary phase further than methionine. We can confirm that based on its RF value. And we can see that this RF value is getting closer to 1 as it moves or approaches the solvent front. In the next part of this question, we're going to consider the chemical formula of these four amino acids analysed. So we've got glycine, methionine, tyrosine and phenylalanine. Part C, predict the order of polarity from least polar to most polar. To do that, we really have to look at the structure of each of these molecules. I can summarise that in terms of polarity, it goes from phenylalanine, tyrosine, methionine and glycine, going from least polar to most polar. How do we go about explaining this though? So we know that all amino acids can consist of a polar amino and a carboxyl functional group. We've got our amino functional groups here, the NH2s, and the carboxyl groups, these COOHs here. That's partly what makes all amino acids very similar. Phenylalanine is the least polar because it consists of a very large nonpolar hydrocarbon group, which includes this benzene ring here. Tyrosine is similar, but it's uh, more polar given that it actually has this polar hydroxyl functional group over this end here. We say that methionine has a smaller nonpolar region and so therefore it is going to be more polar, or the effect of these polar functional groups here is going to be greater. Finally, with glycine, it has the smallest nonpolar region, so just that little section there, which makes it the most polar amino acid out of the four. Part D, predict whether the stationary phase is polar or nonpolar based on your answer to part C. You then need to explain your answer. So remember, phenylalanine is the least polar, glycine is the most polar. Glycine is the most polar component. From the chromatogram over to the right, glycine traveled the furthest up the stationary phase. This means that glycine was least strongly adsorbed to the stationary phase, but it more readily dissolved in the mobile phase. Phenylalanine is the least polar component because it traveled the least distance up the stationary phase. This means that phenylalanine was most strongly adsorbed to the stationary phase and less readily dissolved in the mobile phase. Because of that, we can say that the stationary phase is nonpolar. It will interact better with the more nonpolar components and less readily interact or um, adsorb the uh, more polar amino acids. That concludes part one of subtopic 1.4. I'll see you guys in the next video.